Aloha and welcome to the one within all. Interversians, for quite some time you have heard me speak about my dreams to ditch the job I'm dependent on, cancel all contracts that involve the corrupt dollar bill commerce system, and live a life of freedom from the cult of statism and its tactics of mental and physical enslavement, all while hopefully helping light the way for others while I'm at it. Today I'm very grateful to have manifested the presence of someone who has advanced quite far along in that particular quest, the conscious cook himself, Kenny Pallarantano. He's a proponent of compassion and anarchism, philosophical destroyer of societal spells like the petrodollar and the cult of carnism that many are bewitched by. And most of all, he's a powerful uplifter of all life forms, especially humanity through his work in creating conscious communities of high vibing souls. Kenny has demonstrated with his journey that breaking the chains placed on our imaginations and hearts can create a non-stop series of synchronistic happenings that are capable of carrying a person comfortably through whatever life has in store. Having reduced his material possessions to the bare minimum and disengaged from the mainstream monetary system, all while expressing himself creatively through cooking and teaching, Kenny is an active role model for us all who want to transition from the strained half-life, half-zombification that makes up our stressed out modern society. A living proof of the occult axiom that with a higher standard of moral behavior, one can achieve greater levels of freedom. I would say that with Kenny, you've got the perfect guest for this show. And I couldn't be more excited and grateful to be kicking off season four of Interverse with this conversation. Dear friends and beautiful newcomers, please join me in shooting forth all the loving vibrations that you can wiggle out of your astral body in the direction of our guest. Kenny, my man, welcome to the podcast. Wow, thank you so much. That was... <laughs> <laughs> that was intense. <laughs> that was, it's weird to hear people talk um, about you, I'm sure. I mean, I don't get used to it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, a good practice in receiving and uh, trying to feel that, you know? Oh, wow. Thank well, you. Was that accurate? I mean, this is all just what I've gleaned from what you've written on your website and you know, videos that I've caught you in. So uh, how did I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that all, <laughs> that sounds pretty pretty much what I'm shooting for like that's that's my my goal is to you know be the change I want to see to put in like the most common you know phrase that that sums it up for people but to really you know embody everything that I want to see everyone else be able to experience and change the changes that I want to see the planet go through and our, our species go through and to you know one of my one of my ways of putting it is like whatever world I want to see out there, whatever world that like we want to live in, are you the kind of person that would fit into it? Because if you're not, even if you think you're working towards it, you're really not, you know, maybe in some way you are, but in the, the grand scheme of things, you're not, because you're not being that, you're not practicing that thing. And yeah, so. That's a very yeah. real way of, uh, a down to earth way of saying what everyone talks about when they say that you have to like um, attune your frequency to a higher mm -hmm. vibration. You know, that's yeah. like hippy dippy talk for what you just said, which is you, if you want to be, if you want it, then you have to be it and you have to, uh, you know, align not just your thoughts and feelings on the subject, but your actions, because, you know, that's one of sort of the biggest new age uh, delusions that's out there amongst many. And uh, not that like everything in the new age is negative or wrong, but one thing that I think gets really misunderstood is the law of attraction and how it actually does not manifest anything without also practicing the law of action yeah 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 i i have that conversation a lot with people actually because abraham hicks was one of my my big big doorways to getting getting to where i am now you know um in 2013 a friend showed me one of their videos on vhs tape and as they explained what it was like oh that's this woman that's channeling and i was like mm, i don't know i was coming from like a very you know like physicalist reductionist mindset like well, we can't measure that, so it can't be true. And not even we can't measure it, but like those somewhat authority figures that I think know things, since they can't measure it, or they tell me they can't, then it must not be true. You know, the religion of scientism. But yeah, they show me this video, and at the end of it, I was like, well, I don't know about channeling, but that all made sense. And I just dove into it. I read all their books, uh, you know, many, many, many hundreds of hours of listening to it, just like in the shower or cleaning or whatever. I've got, you know, full CDs in a playlist and just hit shuffle and see what comes up. And that piece does seem to get missed a lot. Like it's always talking about, yes, align your frequency, be like, feel that, be present with it before it's physically real. 
so that when the opportunity, the physical thing that is going to lead you to it comes up, you know it because you can feel the, the potency there, the attraction there. And people don't, they miss that part. They're like, well, I just have to think about it forever. It's like the parable of like the man in the ocean about to drown and like a boat comes by, no, God will save me. Another boat comes by, no, God will save me. Dies. <laughs> well, wh why didn't you help me? Why well, send three boats? You know, like it's like people make that pause. They don't, they, the opportunity comes up and they just don't even, they don't, you have to go with for it. And, you know, a big part of that was the secret, the, the book and the movie and stuff. When that came out, they really, they cut out just a few really important parts of it. Like one, the word vibration. So like they talked about your thoughts and thinking about the thing, but they don't talk about the difference between thinking about it like you have it and thinking about it and knowing that you don't have it. They leave, they left out like, there's like three really fine points that they left out of those movies in order for the company to accept it and make it go mainstream. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the most well-known version of the law of attraction is what came through the secret. And it's like missing like the finest details of it that are actually what make the whole thing work. Yeah. I personally suspect that that's by design, but I don't trust a lot of what makes it to the mainstream just yeah. by the fact that there was so much money getting it there and where does, who's got a lot of money. Usually not yeah. that cool people. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, that, that's changing though. It's changing. I know a lot of millionaires right now. I know a few billionaires now, you know, thanks to the cryptocurrency craziness. Like there's some really amazing people who all of a sudden are having way, you know, way more money than, than any human can spend. So right. hopefully, hopefully that, you know, they, they maintain their everything from before that. And they just, funnel that money into awesome stuff yeah hopefully it's not like winning the lottery because that doesn't go well for people but the uh, maybe right. coin lottery will have gentler effects <laughs> so, well, you, i don't think it gets taxed yet so that's probably cool yeah yeah i mean they want to uh you know that's why coinbase got taken to court and now they have to give up their records for people and stuff but if you're doing it without connecting your 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 assets to that corporate fiction that they actually can claim taxes from, you know, then there's no, there's no way to track it. You know, it's, it's pseudonymous where you can see all the transactions to the wallets and stuff. But if that last transaction is you scanning some other person's wallet and then handing you cash, well, then there's no, the record stops there. If you use Coinbase or something where you then go from Bitcoin over to your bank account, then they now have your bank account linked with every single transaction in that. You know, that's, and that, I, I try to keep people from ever doing that. <laughs> just buy from somebody you know, go to an ATM and just put in cash and have it, you know, something besides connecting that, that corporate person to it. Yeah, and I, I'm not really a qualified person to give advice about cryptocurrency, but I would just suggest to people that if you were going to get into it, be probably diverse with what you did and don't go overboard with uh, how much you put in because, you know, I've always personally found that in my life you kind of just have exactly enough for what you need uh, if you're a regular person <laughs> and, and if you are you're living in balance then you can sort of pay all the bills and all the expenses work out but I I guess if we're going to be like collectively escaping from that whole system then it's important to be actually getting out of the debts and the contracts and stuff at some point so that we can get more separate and more free at least I'm speaking for myself anyway and I guess that's one thing I'm interested in asking you about, like, what's your relationship to the, uh, the U.S. dollar currently? Like, how are, are you uh, stuck doing things like filing taxes still? Have you gotten away from a lot of that bullshit in general? Like, what was that journey? Uh, how's that journey been for you? Yeah, I, uh, I haven't paid or, or filed taxes in well over a decade. Um, I, I worked full time for like, six to eight years somewhere in there and didn't didn't file or pay um i filed for the first couple of years i was old you know i had jobs uh because i was in college and so i could just write all of it off when i got money back at the end of the year um i was always yeah i was always pretty much on the anarchist side of things i just didn't have the words for it i was just like mm, no you're not gonna take my stuff and you're not gonna tell me what to do <laughs> like, so i i i, I never really went along with that um and i've done lots of research you know since then like say, yeah i made the decision and then years later it was like oh cool there's actually a lot of stuff that backs this up you know from 
the the amend the Sixteenth Amendment not being ratified by three quarters of the the Congress to the the laws themselves, the actual tax code, and where it breaks down the income taxable income is only from outside of the U.S. That's what Larkin Rose's whole thing was about. He did letter writing campaigns for years and years, you know. And then finally, they took him to court, and he ended up doing just a few months. And it was because they threw they they made it so that his letter writing campaigns, his phone calling campaigns, all of his videos, his book, all were not usable in court as evidence, and then charged him with willful knowledge or, or willful. It was will some thing to do with uh, with the not paying taxes, but it was willful, which meant that he had to believe that he had a responsibility to and chosen to ignore the responsibility. And then they left out of, of court all the evidence that for five years he'd been saying he didn't believe he had to. And that, that's like the only way they could actually charge him with anything. But, you know, there's multiple IRS agents who have left because they can't find the actual code where it says that people have to do this. Like, from a purely moral standpoint, if someone wants to try to rob me, one, you've got to actually come and do it. Like, don't just send me a letter or like put a belief out there that like, hey, this person will rob you. Like, mm, that's, I'm not scared of that. <laughs> and two, you know, they, I've just found so many different ways of looking at it that all come to like, no, we don't really have to pay that. Like for one thing, that, that identity, the filing taxes, that social security number, that's not me. That all capital letters name is, you know, the straw man is the most commonly used name for it. I'd say it's a corporate fiction. You know, it's a trust that was created with the same name as you about 45 days after you were born using the afterbirth as a property abandoned at sea and using that as collat. Like I've got an article about that. I wrote on steam it last year. It took like oh, 60, 60 hour research paper. Actually. Yeah. yeah I'd love to get in this. I mean, like for one point, just to, to throw something out there, if people, I don't know if a lot of listeners really might be aware of just how deep the conspiracy of the corporate straw man version of themselves is like what it means that your name is in all capital letters on your driver's license, what your birth certificate actually sin signifies what, you know, that would be maybe something good to kind of recap and point people toward resources that are uh, interesting and, in, you know, bringing your mind from that particular construct because it's working on your unconscious mind at all times and your uh, unconscious agreement with it, it, it perpetuates your own continual stuckness in the matrix. But like one thing I wanted to point out about the birth, the birth process itself is one of the very first things they do is uh, stamp the baby's foot and it's the sole yeah. of their foot. It's, you know, every other thing you maybe would do like a thumbprint or a fingerprint, handprint, why the foot? Because it's the soul, which is phonetically the soul. And that's actually how a lot of this legal magic, for lack of a better term, because it is literally a form of word magic that they do with this like legal martial arts. <laughs> and so the soul actually is also saying to your uh, unconscious that it's your soul that they are um, getting a copy of or owning, you know, so it's all illegitimate, of course. And as soon as yeah. you consciously recognize this whole thing, it, it undoes it. But like, you know, well, what made you first aware of, of how, I guess you said you've always been aware of this kind of thing, but like what, who what was a good resource where you really, uh, unlocked a deeper understanding of this system? Um, it, there's, you know, a lot of different stages uh, Jordan Maxwell was one that I got into early who just goes into like the word magic side of it, you know, the, the etymology, where these things came from, the, he, he was, a, you know, the, the gold fringed flag, the you know, Admiralty Court, like all of that, he kind of, he was my first introduction to that. I listened to a lot of his stuff five years ago or so. Um, and then from there, actually, I mostly a friend started getting me going my friend jay noon uh he's he's a awesome anarchist guy he's part of pork fest and jack fest and his his whole family has been <laughs> working against this thing he's been in court dozens of times you know for for different not filing taxes not doing this not doing that so like he just he has no no interaction with their with their stuff at all really you know um, I won't go into too much more because I don't know what 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 he talks about with everyone and what he doesn't. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, um, yeah. But he he got me kind of diving down this much deeper rabbit hole of like I'd heard of the straw man. Okay, I was like, yeah, the piece of paper, I get that, like sort of. 
but I never heard how, how deep it goes, like how the sole of the foot, the, the taking of the afterbirth, the taking of a sample of blood, the difference between a birth certificate and a certificate of live birth, the fact that your parents always are like both things, well, a lot of people don't even get both, whichever one they got or both, they're getting like the second or third copy of, and you have to go through like a multi-tiered process up to the federal often to get the original back. And like for me, as uh, the more I dive into this stuff, the more I'm, it just makes me think of X-Files, watching X-Files as a kid. I'm like, yeah, they showed us this. Like I, just, I remember the filing cabinets where they had people's testings and like showed if they'd been vaccinated at birth and stuff like, and that was part of a big secret conspiracy. Like it was very interesting to, to go down that rabbit hole. And it's, it's so, it's like such a small thing that they actually do, but people just give so much power to it. Yeah. You know, they're like, they identify with their social security number. They identify with, you know, like I, I almost ended up in the military. I went through like the recruit process in high school uh, for like months and months and then ended up dodging a huge flurry, a flurry of bullets, basically. <laughs> Literally. Um, <laughs> but every, every document that you did there, you had to write and sign your name in all capitals, full name. So I had to like learn how to like, write out my middle name in cursive because I had never had to do that before and it was just I was like why they they would just kind of oh you just have to oh you just have to oh you just have to I'm like, what? this doesn't make any sense to. why that's not who I am like that, that literally I had never gone by that name you know I was, my name was Kenneth but I've always gone by Ken you know like I literally never identified with that name to that level so it was really weird to have to write it over and over and I was like this doesn't feel right and yeah, now I'm like, I, I feel like there's still so much I haven't even scratched the surface of, you know, I've gone through a lot of Curtis Collenbach's work and Dean Clifford's work. And well, I've watched a lot of the stuff that uh, was Larry Wayne Turtlegate does. I love I, his energy in the courtroom is great. He doesn't have a lot of the knowledge, but he still manages to get the judges to leave. And thus the case is thrown out a lot. Um, but there's, there's a lot of people talking about it now. And it, the more, the more I hang out with those crowds, you know, Anarchapulco, that's like, it's like a very common thing. It's like half the people kind of have the knowledge and the other half are, that's one of the main things they're asking about. And uh, It's really, it's so easy to disassemble it when, and, and get away from it, like to remove it from your reality. As soon as you see what this is, you know, like even the debt stuff, like people have debt. Well, you, you don't really have any debt, most likely. Your corporate person that you have been acting as an agent of unwittingly has debt. If it has that social security number on it, if it has the all capital letters name on it, if it says date of birth, like all, all of those documents are things that only have to do with this corporate entity. That's, yeah. why the, that's why it's in all capital letters names, for those people that don't know. If you look at any corporation's registration paperwork, their incorporation papers is always in all capitals everywhere. You see it in legal documents too, in court cases and stuff. It's always all capitals for the whoever versus whoever, because those are all corporations that are operating. Yes, are op in, the legal, in legalese, the all capital letters symbolizes something that is actually a corporation. Yeah. And the lowercase version of your name symbolizes a natural live person. So by getting people to carry around the identification, the uh, social security card, and believing that you know they have to have a license to do a certain thing and you know, all the other little things that come along with the play of being a, a law abiding citizen. <laughs> what, what that is, is you're representing a fictional entity. And that's also because you are agreeing to represent this fictional entity and uh, in the legal system itself, all of the basically against natural law, against morality type of things that are passed that are being done to us, to the citizenry, you know, freedoms being restricted, people being executed in the street by police, uh, every bad thing you can think of. In the legal system, it's all actually happening to this fake corporate entity, which is in, because it's artificial, it's in their eyes, it's dead, which means it has no rights. And so by agreeing to represent it, then you're saying, I agree that I also give up my rights. None of which yep. is possible. You can't not have your rights, even if you think that you're giving them away, of course. 
but you know, the more we act and act out in this capacity unconsciously, the more it energizes this entire system. And it seems like what the point of it is, is to literally suck the life out of humanity because you get people working in the name of these uh, fake corporate versions of themselves to pay off the debts that these fake corporate versions of themselves have accrued, even though the actual name itself is traded on the stock market and worth a lot of money or to the people that own it. It's called a stock market because it's stock like livestock, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I mean, recapping on all this stuff maybe is a, for people that are familiar with you, not all that new, but I really urge my listeners to look more into this because it is all a complete fiction. And what you, what is really, I recommend people looking into is really important is uh, natural law and how your rights are actually inherent and what those are and why you should care about them <laughs> because it, it, uh, it's the first step on liberation. I think is knowing, you know, knowledge is the, the key to the lock basically for everything. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not aware of what's going on then you know, if you're not aware of, of your own abilities, your own, your own rights, your like, if you're not aware of how the universe works, if you're like, <laughs> it all comes down to yeah, awareness and knowledge, like how much, how much do you understand this game that we're playing? Like that's, you know, that, that's a big thing for me is it's a role playing game. This is one gigantic role playing game and it's, you know, way more intricate than one that anyone's ever seen inside of this game because it's, it's such a larger scale. You know, we've got all these mini games that people dedicate their entire lives to and stuff, but it's, it's got rules in how it all functions. It functions the same for everybody, just with whatever parameters they're looking at, whichever part of the game they're playing. But yeah, you can't, people can't really do things to you without you agreeing to it in some way. And that's something that, you know, a, a lot of people push back against because the idea that they agreed to something, that, you know, being done to them or some, some wrong happening or something being taken from them doesn't feel good but it's not supposed to. And <laughs> it's, it's really important to know that if you just agree to it at some point unconsciously, and then you don't ever disagree, you don't ever cancel that agreement, then it's just still running. It's not like every day you're thinking about, yeah, like let this thing happen to me, but you agreed to it at some point and you never went back and canceled that contract. So that contract is still active, you know, because they're energetic contract. They're not, it doesn't matter if no, human's mind is consciously aware of it. it doesn't matter if the piece of paper isn't there or something like it's it's there you made it it exists just not within this this three-dimensional tiny fragment of reality that we can observe as humans you know i think i can tie this into kind of what we kicked off talking about which was the idea of channeling and for me i've been looking into zero point energy the zero point mm -hmm. field i trying to get a handle on the you know, how we're all interconnected and what that means. And the, as I start looking into it, all of a sudden it starts lighting all these bulbs in my head, such as with channeling. You know, if there is an interconnecting field of energy that is conscious and intelligent, that is very likely the source of all forms of flow states, including channeling. So that's also how the whole law of attraction concept of reaching the vibrational frequency of the thing to attain it or to draw it to yourself that is because whatever you're vibrating is interacting with the field and then the field vibrates that out and so the external field around you eventually takes on brings on the form of whatever it is that you're attracting if you are actually attracting it and you know like we said it requires being in not in a state of wanting to attract it but in a state of knowing that it is attractive <laughs> kind of yeah. so you know that that's a difficult dynamic to to achieve on a regular basis for a lot of people but it's something that i think is basically part of what life is about teaching us this role playing game it's about teaching us the power that we have to create our own experience and to change from within into whatever version of ourself of the role playing game character we want to be and you know like for you, this is something I was wanting to touch on, so I'll see if I can make this a, a nice segue. But like, I know for you, part of your personal creative practice is with cooking. So, you know, tell me a little bit about that. How uh, how did you find out that you're a vegan? Well, at what point did you actually feel your feelings on the subject and, and know that 
the difference between right and wrong about it. Uh, is it, you know, was that as a child have you always held that instinctually or, you know, did you come to it, come to it through knowledge first, like I did, and then feel the emotional aspect of it after basically unblocking my heart by quitting the practice? For me, it was, I, I, I spent mm, the first couple of decades, you know, most of my life, I, I ate the standard American diet. Um, you know, when I was in my 20s and working full time and stuff, I, I ate the same burger at the same bar, you know, four nights out of the week after work and drank a bunch of booze. Like Sounds like my history. Uh, <laughs> so it's a lot of us. <laughs> and uh, I, at some point, what, 2011, I, yeah, the end of 2011, I took a, a crazy massive dose of some azurescent mushrooms and they shattered my whole old reality basically and i spent a year of just like flailing chaos uh, as my old path all my old belief systems everything was gone but there wasn't anything new to like replace it yet so and then in the end of 2012 which i had no awareness of the mind calendar like oh 2012 is something people said like they said y2k and like they say all sorts of other things that they're always wrong about so i just ignore it uh and it it was not there at all. But then looking back on it, I was like, oh, I started this relationship the 18th of December and the 21st of December, we made love for the first time. And it was this really potent relationship for months and months and months, like almost a year that she asked all these questions that made me reframe my childhood, you know, the word coping mechanisms, which I had never heard before versus like problems with me. Like, no, those are coping mechanisms that you never stopped running. Like, uh, and she introduced me to GMOs and to soy and its effects on the body and gluten and its effects on the body. And so I just went to like a really clean, like organic, non-GMO, non-processed diet. And so doing that, meat became really expensive, you know, to get grass-fed, free-range, antibiotic fruit, like to get meat that was up to the standards I had for all my food, I could now only eat meat maybe once a paycheck or once a week. And as soon as I did that, every time I'd eat meat, I would just feel like crap for like three days afterwards. Like I would feel sluggish. My digestion wouldn't work as well. And so I was like, well, clearly I'm not supposed to eat meat. And then from there, and I, I never did dairy or eggs, really. I didn't, they both grossed me out. So that was like a non-transition. Uh, I skipped vegetarian. <laughs> I went from just eating meat and vegetables <laughs> to just vegetables. <laughs> uh, but then from there, most of what got me there kind of like, logically or you know like philosophically was actually conversations with meat eaters trying to defend their meat eating it was it was it was like talking to statists and getting turned into an anarchist like i talked to meat eaters and got turned into an actual vegan <laughs> well i know that it's kind of wrong but i just love my meat that's what yeah. it comes down to that's the final argument like eventually if you keep going with them whatever they started with will eventually transition to that you know and this isn't like a to hate on meat eaters thing because like I said I was uh, in the cult of carnism for the first 25 years of my life but it is the thing that is probably more rapidly than anything else killing the planet I mean it's kind of like obvious if you look at that the statistics of 50 pl billion plus animals killed for consumption a year that's a hundred percent antithetical to life and you know even if you want to make the argument that humans are evolved to eat meat and that it's not inherently morally wrong because other animals do it to each other it does in my opinion but it, it's what's against natural law in this dynamic that we're in is that the animals we're consuming are not allowed any opportunity or freedom to fulfill their own nature so you know i personally would just quit the practice altogether with carnism because it isn't necessary for and it's actually really healthy to not <laughs> to not eat it anymore i feel great myself my mental clarity is off the charts and my emotional connection to my true feelings that is a huge difference since i quit eating meat and you know if any of those things sound like they would be useful to your own personal spiritual development i do recommend uh, seeing what you can do even if it's starting like you did which is also how i started with the organic non-gmo stuff and scaling back the amount of meat consumption until just kind of just giving up on it um, or quitting it. You know, it's, it's your pace, your journey, but it's something I urge everybody to at least try for some period in their life and see 
how it affects you and if it is positive for your uh, development and you know maybe if it's something you can make a permanent change on because it's that's what's de causing deforestation in the rainforest the huge amounts of land that's being taken up for meat consumption and speaking of the rainforest you brought up the 2012 prophecy and i just wanted to say that probably other people can relate to this as well i personally felt that my healing journey took a big kick start right around the december 21st 2012 mark myself uh, it was definitely a powerful time and shift right then and i think a lot of us have been looking finding a bunch of pieces to this puzzle since then and now more and more communities are putting those together and uh, you know we're seeing a lot of resistance against tyranny <laughs> yeah yeah i i know a, a lot a lot like an overwhelming percent of the people that i meet in my travels uh 2012 was some sort of drastic turning point for him and then as i've researched you know, just a slight tangent. As I research, like the the way that the Taoists look at the cycles, the way the Hindus look at the cycles, the way the Mayans look at the cycles, all of these, like they all kind of synchronized to say that on this giant vibration that we're writing, that is reality. That was a major point. That was, you know, like if you look at it as a circle, if you look at it as a sine wave, like it's the same thing. It, um, and that was the point where one cycle was started. It was actually the beginning of the new cycle. It wasn't really the end of the old cycle. And there had been the 25 year changeover period from 87 to 2012. That was like a cycle ends and there's like a cleanup and then the new one. And from what I've looked at, at least my understandings of these things would say that the previous ages of humanity that got wiped out from the flood and such, you know, the, if you, depending on which culture you talk to, it's, between three and six ages we've lived through now. Um, but that, that, la that happens somewhere in that 25 year gap. And we just cleared that. It's like our, on the, on the scale of things are, are where I think that we're kind of like, we're doing this. It's, it's, yeah, that it gets worse and it gets better, but it's going up. And finally our, our low point is no longer at like total reset of humankind. That's, my understanding of it at least i have nothing to really back that up you know like it's not not something i can actually claim but it's like it it's one of the interpretations you can get from looking at those things it's not like i'm making it up you know what i mean like it's it's one of the options we don't know which of the options it is and it feels the best to me so i'm gonna run with it uh, <laughs> but yeah just as a little bit of a, a side topic there but uh no, that's a great topic. I think I just get behind that idea personally, especially if we do interact with this field of dynamic conscious intelligence around us. Let's go ahead and accept that we made it through the potential for a media wiping us out or some kind of cosmic catastrophe, killing all humans because we're immoral. <laughs> like, we actually cleared that hurdle. Let's just put that into the field because I personally think that we have the potential to, uh, you know, still get wiped out by our own misbehavior regardless of what you know kali the goddess of destruction had in mind through mother nature <laughs> right <laughs> and it is it is cool though to see so many people having a reflection in that in that consciousness that shifted right there and then and that is what it actually means to be entering a new age in my opinion it's a new age of consciousness because once you have studied philosophy and you realize that materialism is just a, a modern disease. And for the most part, philosophers have always accepted the idealism model of reality that everything is a type of thought emanation, a, a construct in, in mind, if you will, then consciousness is the primary grounds for everything and developing in our consciousness is what is going to develop everything physically. And I've been really interested in that on the epigenetics subject lately in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce Lipton's work has been amazing and watching people take that and just run, run with it and all these showing how that can play out and stuff. I, I feel like the, the most important part for any of this and why I, I, one of my favorite things to do is have conversations like this. I mean, in general, but also yeah. especially in a way where like, one or two or a million other people can see it uh, is because I believe that the, our consciousness is where it all happens. It's where, and, and you can, I mean, even a physicalist reductionist 
has to come to that conclusion to a large extent because our consciousness is, a decide, is what decides how we act and how we speak and how we interact with each other. So if nothing else, our belief systems, our thought processes are manifesting our physical world, absolutely, without question. It's just a matter of which steps you're accepting. But at some level, you know what I mean? Like no matter what your, your view of reality is, human consciousness decides human reality. And it's, it's really amazing to see this time where we can connect global, like we can have you know, a real time conversation like this We've never even met in person. I don't know where you are right now. Like we, you know, like it, we can do this for free. Like there's money involved only in like the electricity, the internet, you know what I mean? It's not like we had to pay a fee for this actual chat. Like it's not, you know, like the fact that we have that all over the world now and that we have these events and communities that are forming because people can come together in there and decide to, to become close proximity physically as well. Like, we have we're reshaping the the whole neural network we're reshaped like we're literally reshaping the whole thing in a way that is I, I can't even fathom how powerful it is and it's it's amazing to be here as part of it but i think i no, my point was i think the the most important thing we can do is is changing that consciousness healing our own trauma so that we don't pass it on changing our, you know, releasing belief system. We don't even need to change it. We can mostly just release all. You don't really need to believe yeah. much. Enlightenment is a destructive <laughs> process, right? It's about letting go of the bad, the stuff that doesn't serve us and, you know, turning it into fuel for the fire to develop our true potential. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like that, you know, most of the, the people I would consider to be the biggest activists in the sense of the, the change I see them having on the planet they don't run a nonprofit. They don't, you know, none of that. Some of them do, but most of them, it's just they're spending so much time working on themselves and bettering themselves and then their kids and their relationships and like just starting ground up, you know, like that's, I'm, I'm a total non hierarchical mindset about things. Like I, I think in nature, everything goes from the ground up. One cell changes and one cell triggers, it's like something happens right here and then that spreads. And that's what we're looking at with everything. Like we're cells on the earth. Like we're cells in this organ. That's how I, I like to get around the, the individualist collectivist argument that happens because it's a false dichotomy. It's both. Yeah. Like every cell in your body is an individual. They are, it's a unique thing, but also it cannot survive without all of the others. And what happens to it affects all of the others. And that's where we are. Yes, I'm an individual. You're an individual. Absolutely. I have no right to violate you in it in any way. And you have no right to violate me. But everything that I do, even if it's while well, I'm here and you're over there, is going to in some way affect you. And we have to take responsibility for that individually and as a collective. Because if you realize that, if you actually accept that, if you just say that out loud, like I I am responsible for my own actions. I am my own sovereign being, but I'm also part of this greater and everything that I do has an effect on the greater. Then you can't do things like eat factory farmed food. <laughs> you can't <laughs> like, you can't think about bombing people or you can't, you, know, you can't, you can't do those things knowing that it's all you and you're all part and they're just as much a part of it as you are. They're just, you know, whether it's, we're all God, you know, but some people really don't like the word God or any of those were, you know, but we're all part of the same organism. And so there's no, there's really no way to, to take responsibility for your actions and how they affect the world and continue operating in these, these super destructive, competitive, fear-based ways. Right. Because the definition of taking responsibility is being taking right action over wrong action when you know the difference yeah. and of course it it's a never-ending process of learning what nature considers the right action over the wrong action as you complexify your knowledge into things like how to build a spaceship for example there's plenty of wrong ways to do it and you'll find them all out i'm sure i've never tried but <laughs> <laughs> the basics though the foundational stuff becomes pre-programmed into the biocomputer we're walking around in your physical body has emotional reactions that give you information that tell you when something is or isn't okay. And it literally works like that. And you have an operating system that's your conscience. And that's where the whole non-aggression and self-defense principle both come into play because 
you know, if somebody is violating you, it makes you mad. Anger has a purpose. And it's not about do, you know, it's not about violating somebody else past the point of uh, your rights, but you, you know, you can do whatever you need to do to be responsible for your own self. And I would say you don't have the right to use force beyond what violence is used against you typically. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think if we're all really in that state of, you know, seeing ourselves as interconnected through whether it's through the field or because we're all part of the mind of God or however you want to conceive of it. The point is that unified unity consciousness, that realization that all is self, we all, we all carry that. Then you don't even need to think about the self-defense principles and the, what you would do if a mugger came and how you have the right to shoot him in the face and all that, you know, all of that is actually kind of still, it's still programming that I deal with, like thinking about all the time. Not that I live in like constant fear that I need to defend myself, but that uh, because I see the the violence that's inherent in the system, I'm constantly, you know, basically reminded that there may come a point where I do have to uh, uphold that self-defense principle. So, um, you know, the do no harm thing though, that definitely directly applies to not just how you treat other people, but also how we're treating animals. And because we have, an interconnection through the field, then the suffering in the consciousness of other beings is actually directly poisoning our our minds and our hearts uh, you know, intrinsically and consistently. Exactly. That's one of the things I like to bring up with people who either like don't accept that it's morally wrong or, or do, but are like, oh, I'm going to do it anyways. You know, it's like, yeah, but Think about what you're actually taking in. Think about how those animals have lived. Think about what their experience is. Think about the vibration that's held in that. You know, I bring up Dr. Emoto's work and how we, like, water can hold vibrational states. We can see that in cymatics. We can see that, you know, we, that's good. We can see that clinically, yeah. scientifically. Beautiful. Scientifically yeah. proven, yeah. Yeah. And physical bodies, not just humans, but other mammals, are mostly water. So if these animals are being held in a vibration of suffering and captivity and docility and sickness, that's what's being programmed into what you're going to consume. And now you're taking that in and it's becoming part of you. That's the whole factory farming thing. Like even before true factory farms, like this massive amount of cattle meat production for consumption is all part of turning the human race into cattle. It's not a coincidence that these two things are happening simultaneously or alongside, like it's part of the plan. It's, you can't, it, it's necessary to ingrain it in people at a molecular level, at a, a physiological level to have it work so well on a psychological level. Totally, man. It's, it's actually the most key element in the strategy of repressing universal love or unity consciousness in my opinion is the fact that the the diet and the environment and basically everything that is involved with epigenetics including your consciousness because your mindset actually has a quantum effect on the dna molecules themselves because they're small enough to exist in the quantum rule book you know uh, every little aspect of the epigenetics and the physical uh, material that you're taking in is harmful and it's creating stress stress mentally stress physically and stress what it tends to do to us that keeps us from universal love is either make us completely overactive and reactive and in a state of constant go 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 and constantly seeking to take and get as much energy as you can and having maybe an overabundance of a certain type of energy in a way that's harmful Let me show you an example. Like this is a cup of coffee and it's like 7 p.m. here. Probably don't actually need that. (laughs) You know, that's probably like on the reactive (laughs) stress inducing side of things. Maybe not as harmful as some other things, but as an example. And then the other side of stress is the the repressive and passive inactive uh, way that we behave. And of course, in balance, we actually should be occasionally active and occasionally passive and know when it should be one or the other. But until we uh, accept, uh, take on the gift of acceptance of what it is that we're afraid of and what, like, including things like, I'm afraid that I won't be able to uh, live without meat, for example. <laughs> until we actually take on an acceptance 
of the fact that that's a thought in our heads. And then therefore, because we're accepting it, we're present with it, which also dissolves it and shows you the illusion of it. Then without the acceptance aspect, we're just trapped in the stress cycle. But when you do have the acceptance, it, it uh, eliminates the stress and then you ha can have as much activity as necessary or chill as much as you want without losing your connection to universal love. It's that fear that you're either not doing enough or that you uh, need to do more or that you've done or uh, that, you you to, that you can't do anything. That's what I mean. The other, the other fear would be that you can't do anything. You know, those two yeah. fears are what keep you from even attaining a semblance of the unity consciousness I'm talking about. So yeah, that's what, what you were saying is that it is sort of like a perfect control system because it's self reinforcing on the, the physical and mental and spiritual levels. You're you know, on the emotional level too, because people do have to repress their emotions just to be a practicing member of the meat cult. Since I don't really know anybody that's a human being that could, um, it, not have at least there's a there's a few people out there of course but most people i know would not be able to like slaughter an animal rem with no remorse and then yeah. clean it and eat it so you know but we expect other people to do that for us and that makes it different exactly that that's actually two really important points in in my my life my philosophy one is that idea of your outsourcing responsibility for your own life for your own experience for your actions and that's where statism comes from. That's where organized religion comes from. All of these things are people taking that responsibility that they're supposed to feel. Yeah, if you are starving to death and you kill an animal to eat it, okay. And you're going to feel that and you're going to process it. It's going to be difficult, but it's going to be, it's like a, it's not self-defense, but it is against the world. Like it's, it's a survival thing, but that's all natural. Like that's what you're supposed to go through when you feel that. You're not supposed to have the animal be totally abstracted and it's, you know, a burger. It's a, it's a hamburger. I guess ham is another word for me, but it's like, it's burger. What does that mean? You're having ground cow flesh sandwich. It's a ground cow flesh sandwich. Like, <laughs> you know, the euphemisms work to help with that. And that's the other side is the, the euphemisms around this. You know, kids are told chicken's the only one really where they tell them what it is. But even then they don't like, they don't show them like a chicken and chicken breast or something like they, they make them very separate concepts. You know, my little sister is seven years old. She's been vegetarian for I actually don't know how long, but at least a year, bare minimum, probably a couple of years, just by her own personal choice. Neither of her parents are, uh, our, myself and, and our middle sibling, we're both, she's vegetarian, vegan kind of fluctuates and I'm vegan, but neither of us ever like, sat her down and you know showed her a bunch of stuff or like you know what i mean like we'd never like answer her questions when she asked why and she decided that that's what she was gonna do she's like why well, can't eat animals i love animals and that's kind of the natural state most kids if you just show them an animal you're like hey do you want to kill this and eat it they're gonna be like no why would i ever do that and and even the at a cultural level you can if you if you zoom out which you know most americans kind of live in this american world where they think that that kind of makes everything up and really it's, you know, 5% of the world's population, a little less. Um, but if you zoom out from that, different cultures have different animals that aren't eaten. And then, you know, there's a few cultures where they don't really eat too many animals at all, but of the, of the meat eating cultures, they each have their own animal or animals that they don't eat. And those don't match up. It's not always cats. It's not always dogs. It's not always cow, but like it's sometimes it's cows, sometimes it's dogs, sometimes so obviously it's not like any of these animals are different to a point that humans shouldn't eat them. Obviously it's the part that is agreed upon is that in general, we should never eat animals. And if the other part is what you're disagreeing on, then that's obviously just like the outliers. Really, we should just never eat animals because we all agree on that 90% of the time, 99% of the time, you know, most people don't eat most animals and they wouldn't unless they were starving. And that's, you know, then it's a whole different thing because like life or death situations, I mean, you can't really, it doesn't really change the morality of things, but it changes, you can have more understanding for why someone would do something outside of their normal morality because yeah, it exactly. becomes purely physiological. Right now it's not a life or death situation for, for us, so we definitely have the choice. <laughs> yeah. That is key. Yeah. And there's so many other, like, if that doesn't getting somewhere with something, you know, because I've had 
that the conversation about veganism so many times with people mostly yeah. before i started having it from like a moral belief around it that's what i was like having those having them ask me things in the way that they would ask it and stuff because for me it was mostly it was a physical it was a physical choice first first and foremost it was i trust my body to tell me what it needs because i've stopped feeding it crap and so it can actually communicate with itself and with my brain and it said don't eat meat so i stopped but then at, at the same time i was learning about I mean, the, the effects on the environment from meth, like if you're worried about global warming, if you, if you believe that global warming is a problem that we need to deal with, and I'm not saying I do or don't, I'm just saying if you do, then you need to be aware that carbon is much less of a problem than the methane from the cows that you were eating. If you want to end global warming as it is put forth in, in science right now, stop feeding the human race animals, period. It's done. Problem solved. The yeah. deforestation side being can't, like not not burning up so many trees and stuff to put these animals on is like a bonus level of that too. Just the fact that we're not breeding them in such massive numbers would cancel out so much of that. When you look at the the financial side, the energetic side, in that sense, where are you sending your money? You know, for me, it's like yeah, I have a vegan diet. Like I, I definitely identify with that uh, now, but I don't use the term a lot around certain groups because you can tell you know, people who have had negative experiences with vegans, just like people have had negative experiences with, with anarchists or because there's always those outlier asshole groups. Well, it's really the words <laughs> that they're programmed with meanings other than what they actually are. Yeah, By absolutely. people who want to prevent people from understanding the truth of the concept. Yeah, yeah, a side absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I, for me, it's it's mindful eating. That's that's what my, my, my tagline is for everybody. Like, that's what I tell people, like, you know, if, I, if I'm giving a workshop or something, like it's going to be about mindful eating or maybe like plant-based in there or something. Like mindful eating is the thing because it's not just about like, okay, you stopped eating animals. Like, you know, there's a lot of people who are vegans and who still their entire diet is made up of things that I would never buy or serve to someone or eat. Yeah. Because, you know, it's the standard American diet minus meat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the standard American diet minus meat. So you just replace it with GMO soy. You know, it's like, how is this affecting your body? How is it affecting you physiologically? That's why, you know, going non-GMO, getting away. Organic, you know, USD organic doesn't really mean as much as uh, is important, but it's a good start. It's better. Yeah. But if you're growing it yourself, if you're getting it from the local farmer's market where you know that the guy doesn't spray anything on it, whatever, like that level of toxicity in your food, whether you are, if you are eating meat, okay, if you're eating like wild caught boar that you go out and get, or like wild elk that you go kill and cut up and freeze and all that that's much better for you in so many different ways versus yes. going and buying it at the store and that's part of the the taking steps too you know it's like the, if, okay maybe you're not just cutting out meat but you go to organic meat or you go to only meat that is wild caught or you go to you know you raise your own chicken and kill it once a year or you know there's there's these steps along the way because you're in all of those you're taking more response you're taking more responsibility for the yes. action you're becoming more actually aware of what's involved in the whole thing. And that will cause you personally to shift your own actions. It doesn't matter what someone else told you they did. You'll feel it because you're not hiding those things. You're not just letting someone else take the responsibility for it. You're choosing to actually be aware of what the action is and make a conscious, deliberate choice. And that, that step of choosing to make a conscious, deliberate choice will naturally cause you to change your choices in every situation. If you're doing something unconsciously, and you start doing it consciously, you're going to change the way that you do it in some way. And that, you know, it's going to be different for everybody. And, and it doesn't matter what anybody else told you they did. Like you personally will change it because you're actually involved in the process. Now it's not just some program that someone else put into your computer and you've been running ever since. I think that's totally, totally key. The, the bringing of awareness to every aspect of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you know, food is so important in that way, you're you're giving your time, your money, whatever, you know, your energy in that sense. Money is money is just time energy that you've converted into some other form. Generally speaking, people use jobs, which are like these big, really wonky ATMs, basically where you put in time and you get out dollars. <laughs> well, that's why I was saying before that the whole commerce system is like vampiric and draining the life force energy out of people because everyone exchanges their physical energy for this money but then the money all inevitably piles up and goes more and more hoarded into the hands of a few people so it's like the energy of 
the human race instead of cycling within itself is being sucked out and held somewhere else. And it's yeah. actually being energized to fuel the dead is what the cultists would say, in my opinion, anyway, from my uh, looking into like the word magic side of things. And like we're, we're fueling the dead corporate versions of ourselves. We're literally fueling our own destruction and death also because the, the taxes that are paid by these corporate entities that we represent are, you know, paying for wars and paying for all the soft kill eugenics things like what they're spraying in the sky and, and what they're putting in the GMOs and every level of this super multifaceted attack on our biology. And I think proof is in the pudding about epigenetics in that we have still yet to see mass death and succumbing to a lot of these, these eugenics programs that I just touched on. I mean, it's such a perfect storm of, of different unhealthy things and toxic things in our environment that it seems to me that it's pure sheer willpower and belief alone that keeps most people unconsciously chugging through their unhealthy lifestyle and habits. They don't actually know how bad it's hurting them. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword to gain awareness because I think it does possibly create a more of a resonant nature of the negative effects of things that you do to yourself because you are at a higher frequency with your consciousness when you then try to merge with something that's lower vibrational, it brings you down more, you know? It's like the difference between, uh, like to go back to guns, like uh, an AK-47 can get all dirty and rusty and it's like more simple, but like a really nice gun would get com get completely jammed if you were like going through the mud with it. Or a microchip mm -hmm. is a good example. A finely tuned microchip can be thrown off by like a speck of dust, but a simple right. machine can be totally you know, greasy and torn, torn up and still function. And so in the same way, like people that are low vibration in their consciousness, they say they feel fine. I feel fine eating meat. And they just don't actually, it's kind of like a smoker who doesn't know how much different it feels if they would quit smoking. You, yeah. um, be, and because you do actually have a lower frequency, I think people resonate with the lower frequency energies more like what's on TV, like the stuff that they are eating. And it mm -hmm. does actually give them more of a feeling of energy than if they were to eat, try to do something higher vibing because much in the same way, it's like pulling them away from where they're at. So it's kind of weird for them. Um, but I, you know, that's, that's my take on it in terms of why it seems like, at least for me, the further I go into cleaning up my act with my intake, the more I actually do notice kind of sensitivity to stuff that, I did cut out if it ever comes back around, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's just, you're becoming comfortable with something because it's the way that it, it's what your brain is currently programmed for. It's what your filters are set for. You know, you can see it in like the very simplest explanation I, 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 that I, everybody always gets is like a cow town. You go to a cow town for the first time and it smells really bad. But if you live there for say a couple of days, you don't smell that anymore. And your brain does that with everything. It filters everything out based on, well, if this is always there, then we don't really need to pay attention to it. If we don't believe this is possible, we don't need to pay attention to it. If we, you know, you're like, that's what we're doing. The, the conscious mind gets this tiny, tiny fraction of what your brain is processing every minute or every second based on the filters that you've put into it or that someone else has that you were, haven't bothered to go back and look at. And that's, that's why... That's, that's part of why I feel like the, the law of attraction, those they, and a lot of the different, yeah, psycho mystical, I don't, I don't know, things where you're combining like the energetic world and how your brain works. I feel like those are so important be, just because they get you to focus on your thoughts, focus on your belief systems, focus on what things make you feel, what things like you're, you're, you're learning how to operate the computer that is your brain. Because we don't have a user interface, really. Like, I mean, we do. It's gigantic. <laughs> yeah. What uh, What's 2018 look for like for you? This episode of the show is going to be coming out early January, so people are okay. starting their year. Where maybe where might they be able to see you if they're folk in your area or maybe elsewhere in the world that you plan on traveling? Um. Let's see. Well, the the 12th of January, I'll be in uh, Denver, Colorado, for the Community Share Fest. Um, which is a, it's like a 12 hour, like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Just amazing conscious music 
a bunch of friends of mine, bringing some people up from California, actually, and then a bunch of the Denver crowd. Um, and I'm going down to Acapulco for the Anarchapulco conference, which is now like a week and a half long. And we have like a month long decentralized fork of the conference uh, that will be happening around the town after that. And then uh, March, I'm going... It's all, I, I try to leave things pretty loose. I try to have, you know, one event every few weeks so I can just go with the flow coming out of an event. Like, if I have a plan, then that means I have to get from there to this other thing. If, I, if it's open, then it, I can just hop in a bus with people going that way or I can, you know, whatever, whatever comes up. Uh, but I'm going on an Abraham Hicks cruise, actually, out in the Caribbean. I've wanted to do that for, like, four years, and it just always was the same week as Rainbow. And then last year... I got together like half the money and went to put down my deposit and it was like the day that you had to have your payment in <laughs> paid full. And so this year with, uh, with the crypto boom, I, that was one of the first things I was like, all right, well, I'm definitely like, that's been the only thing that stopped me so far. So I'm just going to do that now. Um, then April, probably free your mind conference up in Philly. Oh, they're having and another, that is happening again. It's, it's like 80%. Um, so I'm guessing it probably will. That's um, one that I really want to get to. I haven't been to before. If it if it does manifest again next year, it was really good. I, I went this last, this year. It was really good. If not, um, or maybe in addition to uh, in April is also Voice and Exit in Austin, Texas, which is uh, an anarchist decentralized uh, technology kind of conference and festival combined. Cool. Um, that's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's actually on Steam at, at Scotter Monkey. <laughs> is uh, one of the guys helping run it. So I'm gonna Okay, I'll look into that. Right um, I'll link to that in the show notes too because I'm wanting to connect with more people on Steam that are like-minded. I think that's a really great resource that I've been neglecting. And also yeah. going to events like more anarchist events, considering I've never actually publicly been to an anarchist event, that would be pretty awesome. So maybe I'll catch you at one of those things uh, in the first half of the year and yeah. anything you want to give people to look at link wise i've i've linked your website kenny's conscious <laughs> kitchen and your steam profile but uh perhaps anything else you might want to promote before, while we're wrapping up the uh, conversation here um i'd say if, if you go to my website or you can find it on my steam it but i think it's way down there i have a thing called my my world changing events list uh, it's under research and then lists on my website and it's literally a spreadsheet of like 160 conferences convergences festivals things that I've, I've i update every however many months i actually get around to it because it takes a long time to do with the dates for the next year and then it has the locations and the websites for all of them too uh, so it's a great resource you know no matter where you are there's there's stuff going on in your region sometimes um if you haven't gone to a rainbow gathering before, please come out. Uh, U.S. Nationals is the big one, July 1st through 7th. That's been happening since 1972. Uh, I've got lots of articles and talks I've given about rainbow, so I won't go into it too much if somebody wants to. Just Google my name and rainbow and you'll see it. <laughs> uh, but it's it's the the most important event that's happening, I feel like, because everything else is like either kind of escapey or it's like let's talk about the stuff. And like, that's really like mentally, like talk about these, pro like, you know, come up with ideas or share ideas And rainbow is just like, all right, let's pretend that we're already there. Let's live as though we live in the future where we all recognize each other as family. And we all live based on the migration principle and tens of thousands of people at a time. It happens all over the world at this point. Uh, none of them are that big besides nationals pretty much, but like every country in the world has its own rainbow gathering. Every state in the U S has their own regional every year, pretty much like, it's it's a huge huge piece of of the transition that most people don't know about most people most festies don't really know about it they, they're like oh it's kind of like burning man right like most anarchists have never heard of it whatsoever it's really been amazing to me how 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 small the reach of this giant thing is in that it's way the, it's that thing we we're talking about it's that internal resistance and uh to acceptance we are actually free there is nothing in what we've talked about that constitutes anybody being in any way not free. It's only a perception of such that separates you from just going ahead and living that way. So I'd love to get out to some rainbow gatherings and I love your perspective on everything we've talked about, man. This has been an awesome conversation. It's right up my alley. Great way to kick off the uh, new year and the new season of the show. 
And I do hope to have you back without too much time passing because I feel like we could just pick up right where we left off. This has been awesome. Yeah, this has been absolutely amazing. Uh, really grateful for it. Thank you so much. And yeah, I look forward to having another conversation sometime and, and interacting in the, in the physical world somewhere. Yes. I'm always flitting all over the place. So <laughs> it's, it's just a matter of time. I've, I've really come to that conclusion in general with, with people. If you have any sort of connection, even just like reading somebody's work, like the way I phrase it now is always, man, I'm looking forward to when I meet that person. Yeah. Cause there's no doubt in my mind that it's going to happen at this point. <laughs> yeah, because they're actually just a figment of your mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're, people listening, we're just voices in your head. <laughs> and we hope we were the good voices <laughs> drowning out the bad ones anyway thanks man this has been awesome like i said awesome 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 <laughs> thank you again. so much thank you so much for coming on and uh we'll talk to y'all later there you have it friends kenny palarentano a living example of the possibility of a highly simplified life rejecting the illegitimate mandates of the state and maintaining health, happiness, and creative freedom. I absolutely love this chat since we hit on so many of the topics I'm interested in lately. It was super great to get to know a really cool guy like Kenny a little bit better. He's absolutely a role model for me personally as I attempt to transform myself from a programmed man bot to being a fully free and wild human being. Not an easy journey for most of us, but it sure does help motivate me to see somebody like Kenny who is living the change he wants to see in the world so fearlessly. And I hope you guys got as much out of the first episode of Season 4 as I did. I think combos like this help me put a little bit better perspective on my diet, something that's really easy to ignore. But it would be great if all of us could be just a little more mindful of our eating habits because surely none of us are perfect and food is one of those areas in life that gets better and better the more creative and informed you are about it. In the plus extension to this episode, Kenny goes more in depth about cooking as a flow state and how improvising in the kitchen can be a psychedelic experience of intuitive and creative combinations. Imagination can be expressed in just about anything by a person who is truly awake and aware in the present moment. So in plus, we also get into more in-depth cryptocurrency discussion. We talk about the rising value of Steam and what potentials there are for that platform and also some great personal stories of synchronicity that Kenny shared. It's just as good or better than the first half of the combo, so if you aren't on Interverse Plus yet, then you're kind of missing out on some tasty morsels of podcasting. Yeah, sure, I realize most of you aren't ready to make a $5 donation to something like a podcast that you expect to be free, but I do ask that you consider that in nature, relationships are about exchanges of energy, rhythms of charge and discharge. And you like nature, don't you? So throw some juice into this podcast blender because I can only squeeze a little bit more out of ener energy out of this 28-year-old monkey suit. The free show will always be there for you, of course, but you can reciprocate some energy and get double your weekly episodes by signing up at patreon.com forward slash interverse. And with plus, you're essentially donating a dollar per episode, which seems reasonable to me. There are a plethora of perks to snag on Patreon besides just the extended episodes, including monthly live hangouts. I'm going to give you guys a date for the next one in the coming week, and I'd really like to see more people get on those and get a little bit bigger and have some fun, free expression with you guys. I know it's lame to go on and on asking you for donations, but listener support is the only kind this show gets. There are no ads and there are no sponsors other than the pledges I get from the Interverse community of amazing artists and free-thinking future gods. So with that being said, we have had a bit of a slump on new members lately, so it would be a real beautiful thing to see some of you jump on board with Plus. If you want to help in a free way, you can just share the podcast with others who you think will enjoy it too. You can also subscribe to the show on iTunes and drop us a five-star review if you want to guide other seekers to our tribe. And if you write something nice on there, I will be happy to give you a shout-out on the show and read it. I'm hugely looking forward to this new year and season four of the show. I think this is the point where I'm going to maybe even hit my stride with this podcasting gig. After last year, I feel like I can keep this train chugging forward for quite some time and eventually maybe even find my way out of the 9 to 5 grind and into a full-time podcast grind. I'd love to see all of you make your dreams of creative liberation come true this year too, so 
Make sure and drop me a line. Tell me how you're doing and what you're up to. Maybe even hop on a podcast with me. You never know. Contact me through social media or my website anytime. I'd be really thrilled to hear from you, see what you're doing, look at your paintings, and whatever, man. Read your poems. <laughs> I love you guys. Don't forget, you can check out Kenny's work at kennysconsciouskitchen.com. That's linked in the show notes along with links to Interverse Plus and the music in this episode, which was by Martin's Garden. I will also include a link to Anarchapulco, which is an anarchist convention coming up in February in Mexico. For anyone that might be attending later in February, I'm going to be trying everything I can to make sure I got a little bit of cryptocurrency to spend on plane tickets to that gig because it looks really wicked cool. And I'd also love to see some of you guys there. But that's it for now. Cross your fingers for me that I can get that steam into a wallet and turn into Bitcoin. And... I love you guys. Thank you, friends. It's super cool that you were listening. And remember, all is love. Fear is illusion. All beings are free. Truth can never be destroyed. Okay, see y'all next week.